I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back, everyone. China History Podcast, episode 301. Laszlo Montgomery here, as always. Today, I want to, once again, if no one has any strong objections, look at one of my favorite subjects, the many histories of the Chinese diaspora. Aside from that one on the uh, Chinese Mexicans, CHP 123, and of, and of course, all the ones covering Chinese American history, I've mostly stuck to the good old tried and true, Southeast Asian overseas Chinese. The gift that keeps on giving never disappoints as far as history is concerned. But this time, I'd like to discuss the great nation of Jamaica. We go from alchemy last time to reggae in this episode. And as far as the linkage between the worldwide popularity of reggae and other Caribbean music and the Chinese Jamaicans, we'll get to that later on. The history of Jamaica's ethnic Chinese population might seem familiar to many of us who have studied or experienced Chinese American history, and of other places as well. As the story unfolds, you might find the words often attributed to Mark Twain about history rhyming to be the case here. The number of permutations involving all the five main non-Mandarin-speaking linguistic groups and All the countries in the world where they emigrated to in significant numbers leads to a historical tapestry where, when you observe it, you see familiar patterns. But the individual experiences these overseas Chinese ended up having really depended on where it was overseas that they ended up. The story of the Chinese Jamaicans is another Hakka story. Just as it was in the U.S. where... Mostly the Hoysanese made up the bulk of the Chinese who came for gold or to build the railroads. In Jamaica, it was overwhelmingly the Hakka Chinese who wrote this story. And when they weren't speaking the local Jamaican patois, they communicated in the Hakka language. There was no gold in Jamaica, nor were there any major railroad projects. Jamaica's gold back then was sugar. And in order to get that refined sugar into the teacups of European and American nationals, the front-end process required a vast amount of manual labor in the cane fields of the estates or plantations of Jamaica. Nobody likes being a slave, and for this reason, the British plantation owners needed to force them to accept it, which eh, usually works for a while. But in Jamaica's case, as early as 1811 four years after Britain got out of the transatlantic slave trade, and and three years after the abolition bill declared the trading of African slaves, quote, utterly abolished, prohibited, and declared to be unlawful, end quote. The British were exploring the idea of importing Chinese labor to supplement the African slave labor. Well, nothing came of this, and the timing wasn't right yet. Many decades later, in 1854, the timing was much better. The Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 was passed, which put an end to that peculiar institution, on August 1st, 1834. So without slavery, the plantation owners of Jamaica had to pivot to a new model. And this is when other options began to be explored, including the idea of importing Chinese workers. And history has recorded the first arrival of Chinese into Jamaica to be July 30th, 1854, when a vessel named the Epsom arrived with 267 Chinese men who had embarked on this voyage from Hong Kong. Slavery had been abolished, but the next best thing, as far as the plantation owners saw it, was indentured servitude, which was a kind of contractual slavery with a time limit on it. Not long after, on November 1st of that year, 195 more Chinese arrived on a ship called the Vampire. These were some of the survivors of a group of 705 Chinese who had worked on the Cologne-Panama City Railway 
17 days later, another 10 Chinese made landfall in Jamaica on the Teresa Jane. And this was the initial start. This is where it all began. When this group arrived in 1854, there were actually already two or three dozen Chinese already on the island. No one knows anything about them, how they got there, or what their story was, but I'm sure it was incredible. It had already been 366 years since Bartholomew Diaz made it to the Indian Ocean, and a lot of people from everywhere, whose names we'll never know, were already living somewhere else. More Chinese laborers would be contracted to work the four bucks per day to risk their lives working in the heat and fighting off tropical diseases that decimated the ranks of Chinese farm workers wherever they ended up in the Caribbean. Another couple hundred came from other plantations on Trinidad and Guyana. And these, too, were contracted workers. The whole indentured servitude thing will finally be outlawed in 1917. But for now, under the current system of indentured servitude, the real quality of the daily lives of these workers was eh, hardly any better than a slave. So this was the first wave of Chinese to make it to Jamaica's shores. All their trials and tribulations mirrored in one way or another what was experienced by their fellow overseas Chinese who emigrated elsewhere. And it was only natural that these earliest pioneers would eat the most bitterness and suffer the worst indignities. The first wave of workers were all agricultural workers. And as fate would have it, these particular Hakka Chinese, I read that they were part of the fourth of the great waves of Hakka migration from the north of China to the south, as proposed by historian Luo Xianglin in the 1930s. We all recall from that episode on the history of the Hakka people, these people who will later on be called the Hakka people from the central plain of China, they moved en masse in the 4th century following the fall of the Jin and Wuhu invasions, and then again when the Huangchao Rebellion put the final nails in the coffin of the Tang Dynasty. Jurchen and Mongol invasions from the north caused a third wave, and then came all the misery and unrest of the Ming-Qing Dynasty transition, followed by the 17th century Sea Ban, or Hai Jin, instituted by Emperor Kangxi. The Sea Ban you all recall, was that edict issued by Kangxi that forced everyone to move inland with the objective of leaving absolutely nothing for the pirates to plunder along the China coast. And this indirectly led to a lot of Hakka people settling down in the rich and bountiful Guangdong province. And this, of course, was the setup for the Bunti Hakka clan wars of 1855 to 1868. It was no different for these Hakka Chinese in Jamaica than it was for many of their Hakka brethren in other lands living under similar circumstances. They were sitting ducks to be ripped off, taken advantage of, and to suffer insults and occasional violence. These were the ones who came to Jamaica and who planted the seeds. The next important wave of Chinese migrants to Jamaica, as it was in every budding Chinese community from Burma to Belgium, were the ones who got to cultivate all the seeds planted by those who had come before them. July 12, 1884, after enduring a wretched 67-day voyage complete with typhoons, another group of 696 Chinese arrived on the Prince Alexander. There were maybe a couple dozen Hoisan Chinese, and the rest Hakka from these three cities of Dongguan, Huiyang, and Bao'an. I used to be a regular visitor to all three of those places in the 1990s when they became major manufacturing centers in China. The record stated that this vessel carried 508 Chinese men, 109 women, 59 boys, and 17 girls. Most of them were destined for all the harshness of the Duck and Field sugar plantation in St. Thomas Parish in the east of Jamaica. Others got sent to estates in other parishes in St. Mary, Portland, St. Andrew, and Westmoreland. In two years, the conditions at Duck and Field, one of the poster boys for the worst of colonialism, they got so bad that the Chinese workers went on strike. The concessions they received were yeah, hardly anything to speak of. 
and a lot of the more enterprising of the Chinese plantation workers looked around and saw how many of their colleagues and kin were dying from everything this life in the cane fields could throw at them, and they knew they had to get out. But one thing was for sure, with no one standing up to be their champion or fight for their rights, these Hakka Chinese knew they had to organize to defend themselves. In 1887, the Qigong Tong was established to serve the interests of the Chinese community. This was an organization of Freemasons, and they were joined in 1891 by the Chinese Benevolent Society, or Association as it was later called. This is no different from what we saw happen in San Francisco, New York, or elsewhere, wherever you could find a big enough Chinese community who was putting up with the Racism, selective enforcement of laws and regulations, inequality under the law, eh, the usual stuff. It was just a natural course of action to organize. And these founders of these associations were the machers of the community, the ones most respected and who had acquired the most street cred. Chin Tong Kao and his brother Chin Len Kao were such people, and the Chinese Benevolent Association and the Qigong Tong too filled that vacuum and was able to go to bat for their fellow Chinese who were on their own in this faraway land. And these two brothers were among the founding fathers of the Chinese Jamaican community. That year, in 1891, the census showed only around 481 Chinese on Jamaica. So many had already left, and so many had perished. But one interesting thing happened. Among the earliest Hakka arrivals who came 1854 to 1864 was a man named Chin Pa Kong, who was also known as Robert Jackson Chin. He survived the plantation life and opened up a grocery wholesale operation on Pechon Street in downtown Kingston. A couple more of his fellow Hakkas opened up similar operations nearby, and this formed the root of what was to become one of the Chinese Jamaicans several claims to fame. It began right here, downtown Kingston. And I guess you could say these Hakka Chinese sort of took to this whole business of grocery and dry goods stores and wholesaling as well. And from this nucleus in downtown Kingston, they spread out. And it didn't take long for these Chinese to pretty much establish one small store in just about every town and village of Jamaica. And so ubiquitous were these stores, and the consistency of the product mix they all sold, they became known as Chinese shops. And one other thing, Robert Jackson Chin, the one who got the whole thing started, I'm not sure exactly when, but... Anyway, in Jamaica, that surname, Chin, no matter what a Chinese Jamaican surname may have been, in that society, in that culture, the ethnic Chinese, the older men, that is, were called Mr. Chin. And depending on who you were, some didn't like that moniker, some didn't mind. Didn't matter. This was the name that was commonly used back then to address an ethnic Chinese Jamaican. No offense intended. Mr. Chin. I was the only Caucasian in the two companies I worked for when I did my Hong Kong stretch in the 1990s, and hardly a day passed where I wasn't called a guaylo to my face or behind my back. Never bothered me. Culture comes in all shapes and sizes. And just as the early Chinese gold miners and railway workers in California got the word back to their relatives and fellow villagers about the money to be made, so it was with these Hakka grocery entrepreneurs. Word spread among the Hakka communities from Bao'an to Huiyang to Dongguan about the prospects in the dry goods business. Dry goods, essential groceries, sundry items, the daily necessities of life, including rice, flour, cooking oil. There was a very stable and decent income running one of these shops, and a very solid wholesale and distribution system was already in place. The former slaves had been emancipated for a while now, and though still overwhelmingly poor, they did work and they did earn money, and people... No matter how downtrodden, they needed things, just the most basic stuff. And these shops, they had it. And if you were short of money, they sold it on credit, providing this secondary service as well. And they came, 
And in Jamaica, they found hardships, of course, as any immigrant would. But 1850s, 1860s, no matter the hardships a Hakka family might face trying to get started in Jamaica, the alternative in China was not that much better. The Taiping Rebellion, the Bunti, Hakka Wars, famine, lawlessness, and overpopulation that came as a result of all those fat years of the Qing, 18th century. Yeah, a lot of southern Chinese, not just these Hakkas in rural Guangdong, all had the same idea. This period in the second half of the 19th century saw a supernova of emigration to points all over the world. Well, you know how it is. If you've studied Chinese-American history or that of the greater overseas Chinese diaspora, one recurring theme we see in almost every instance is the resentment and hard feelings of the local indigenous population whenever they see the ethnic Chinese as a group working their way up to the middle classes, or in some cases, even higher. It must be human nature or something. By the turn of the century in Jamaica, so effective had the Chinese been in essentially taking over this one industry. Their competitors tried to seek relief from the government. The Chinese didn't create this retail wholesale trade. It was already there. By the end of the 19th century, around 18,000 Chinese had made their way to the Caribbean. It wasn't near the numbers that went to Southeast Asia or Canada or America. But in Jamaica, at least, some segments of society were feeling uneasy. In 1911, the Chinese Jamaican population was 2,111. In 1882... The American government instituted the anti Chinese exclusion laws. Well, over in Jamaica in 1905, they started getting the same idea. They didn't slam the gate shut or anything, but Chinese had to register for entry prior to arrival. They couldn't just show up anymore. They also had to have a personal guarantor from the community. Eh, not impossible, but it deterred many, I'm sure. In 1910, hopeful Chinese immigrants to Jamaica had to plunk down a 30-pound deposit and pass a written test showing they could write 50 words in English. Some accounts I read said they had to write 50 words in three languages. Either way, you get the main idea. One of the characteristics of immigrants is how so many of them, wherever they go, will often do whatever is necessary to get established in their new land. And this meant working harder and longer and for less money. And this just drove the local people crazy. This whole idea of getting used to a certain lifestyle, rhythm of life, and then being forced to work harder and being squeezed by employers to work for less because they had the immigrants to leverage against them, this usually led to violence in one form or another. And Jamaica was no exception to that rule. In the cases of these shopkeepers, especially the Creoles, the half-African, half-European Jamaicans, they were having that exact same problem with their Chinese competitors who seemed to never close their doors, extended credit to customers, and kept their costs low and lived frugally. In 1917, a law was passed to protect Creole shopkeepers and businessmen against, quote, undue competition and improper methods on the part of the Chinese shopkeepers. Directly or indirectly, they are the causes of so many bankruptcies, vagrants, paupers, and a very large percentage of our best citizens who left the island for foreign parts have lost their businesses or jobs on this account. End quote. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Many of Jamaica's ethnic Chinese, who began their lives in the cane fields or banana plantations, had scrimped and saved and worked their way up to the middle class. And regrettably, this put a target on their back and made them a convenient scapegoat for when parts of society were looking to blow off steam. 
the Hoisan Chinese immigrants in the major cities of the U.S., they were already too familiar with this treatment and scorn that was being meted out on their Hakka cousins in Jamaica. And in July 1918, as the last German offensive of World War I was underway over in France, many of Jamaica's Chinese found themselves under siege. It all began 22 years to the day before Ringo would be born on July 7th. There's multiple versions about how this all started, but one of them claimed this Chinese shop owner, Feng Su, caught his woman in flagrant delecto with another man. This happened in the north part of St. Catherine Parish in the town of Uerton in the countryside. I'm sure quite a scene was made, and Feng Su gathered a few of his friends, and together they gave this man a whooping and sent him running for his life, and he disappeared and hid until things cooled down. Such a small place as Uerton, when things like this happened, the whole town got word, and people, being people, you know, rumors began to spread about what happened over at Feng Su's residence. And this gentleman, who was carrying on with Feng Su's woman, was a police corporal, and in his absence, whilst hiding out, people began to say he was killed by these Chinese. And from there... The situation devolved into a free-for-all with rumors about how the Chinese killed him and all the things those Chinese did to desecrate that police corporal's body. A mob assembled and went on the rampage, including many of the local women. They, too, joined in the fray. Every Chinese business in sight got smashed up. These shops were a symbol of what the Chinese had managed to achieve, and people vented their anger and frustrations on these stores and looted them all. From village to town to village they went, often carrying the most frightful weapons. And so spontaneous did everything happen, so quickly, no planning. It just happened, and local law enforcement in Uerton was caught flat-footed, and by the time they organized to tamp down the violence, the worst had already been done. Word spread to other towns in St. Catherine and in St. Mary Parish in the Northeast, as well as to two other parishes. Many of us have seen it all before in our own countries. Stores smashed, looted, goods carried away. Well, this went on for a few days. And the fact that this policeman, who had unwittingly started the whole thing, because he was hiding out and couldn't be found, it lent credibility to the rumors flying around about how he was murdered, and worse, by the Chinese, and nobody was going to allow them to get away with that. These 1918 anti-Chinese riots only lasted a few days, but eh, usually that's all it takes. Everything was later brought under control, and in St. Catherine Parish alone, there were 452 arrests and eh, a few hundred convictions. The Chinese Jamaicans suffered a massive hit to their community, and unlike later anti-Chinese riots that would happen, this one was mainly about race. But despite all that, Chinese immigrants kept coming. 674 came in 1921. Most of those were families of men who were already in Jamaica, including many wives. Before Chinese women began arriving, Chinese men gravitated towards Creole and African Jamaican women. The government frowned on this, as did many local people, but eh, despite all that, love always finds a way. But as more women and girls began arriving from the homeland, Chinese men tended to marry them instead. Hakka women have always enjoyed quite a stellar reputation back then, and still today, and they may or may not be the hardest working women in Chinese culture, but that sure was the reputation they had. And they worked alongside men, sharing in all the hard labor. And though it was outlawed in 1912, Hakka women never went in for the foot-binding tradition, which allowed them to handle their workload without that impediment. The next years, in 1922 and 23, another 497 and 559 Chinese arrived, bringing the population up to around 4,000. They may have only made up, perhaps, 1% of the Jamaican population, maybe less than that even, but 28% of the business licenses were held by Chinese bosses, if you get the picture. 
Gambling was rife throughout Jamaica, and the Chinese, who called Jamaica their home, they controlled all the pika pow and drop pan action. Yep, poor man's Vegas. These two simple games of chance were popular throughout Jamaican society, especially with the poorest, because you could wager pennies for a chance. Both were numbers games. In drop pan, 36 tickets are dropped in a pan, and you bet on what the winning number would be. pika pow For that, you were handed a paper sheet with 120 numbers printed on them. 30 numbers would be secretly selected, and if you had all 30 of those on your sheet, you won. Sounded like easy money, but as it is in all gambling establishments, odds always favored the house. Despite the small pleasures that petty gamblers enjoyed, playing drop pan and peek-a-pow, gambling as well as opium smoking, led to the newspapers speaking out against the Chinese and their association with both vices. In 1926, Colonial Secretary Wyson called for extreme measures to, quote, keep the Chinese in line. The newspapers regularly disparaged the Chinese Jamaicans and acted as a platform for local people to vent their concerns. One had written, quote, Let us, in heaven's name, wake up and do something, for these people are coming, coming, always coming. Can anything be done to stem this Chinese invasion? Are these people to be allowed to overwhelm us? End quote. It was the same old thing over in the land of the free. The Chinese must go. There were plenty of Dennis Kearneys all over the world. A Chinese school was established that tried, in vain, to preserve the Hakka culture that the immigrants had left behind. A public school was established, which led many locals to pour scorn on the Chinese for not assimilating and clinging to their traditions and being a band apart. It was a harsh choice. Give up your Chinese Hakka identity and embrace Jamaican culture wholeheartedly or face the criticism that they were merely opportunists who had no intention to be one of them. In 1931, the numbers of Chinese continuing to arrive in Jamaica was such that the government reached out to the British authorities in Hong Kong and requested them to cool it with the passports being issued to Chinese. And in the halls of government, there was plenty of squawking about keeping Chinese immigration low or halting it altogether. In 1940, Chinese exclusion officially came to Jamaica when laws were passed barring all Chinese immigration with the exception of diplomats, tourists, and students with permits. Despite all the prohibitions, by 1943, the census showed the ethnic Chinese population had grown to 12,394, of which 40% were classified as Chinese colored. In 1938 came more anti-Chinese riots. Jews, Syrians, and others, too, were targeted. This time, the outrage was against the relative economic success that these immigrants enjoyed compared to the local people. The Great Depression hit the world hard, including in the Caribbean. People were struggling. And just like today, when employees believe the man isn't giving them a fair shake, well, in Jamaica's case, it one day reached that point, and an incident happened that provided the spark. And people looking for someone to blame looked at those who were regularly excoriated for their perceived racial and cultural separateness from the mainstream Jamaican society, and of course, for their success as a group. And then all hell broke loose again. 1918 and again in 1938, people got to blow off a little steam. There was plenty to be dissatisfied with in Jamaica, and the whole colonialism thing was really starting to rub people the wrong way. And new voices were coming to the fore that galvanized Jamaican public opinions. Three years after Jamaican independence on August 6, 1962, one day, Saturday, August 28, 1965, the Beatles were playing in San Diego that night. But over in West Kingston, rioting broke out over a rumor that three brothers from a Chinese-owned store brutally attacked a female employee over on Spanish Town Road and made false accusations against her. And this one took on a life of its own, and elsewhere in Kingston, more rumors got passed around about a number of outrages committed by Chinese against 
African Jamaican workers. And like the other time in 1918, everything happened so spontaneously. There was no plot, no call to action. There was a flash, and then anyone fishing for excuses to start a riot didn't have to look hard. So over the weekend of the 28th and 29th of August, Chinese-owned businesses in the vicinity of Barrie, Queens, Orange, and North Streets, they were looted and burnt down. The whole thing lasted about a week. A delegation of Chinese appealed to the Chinese embassy for help. They were sent away empty-handed and told, ain't nothing they can do since, although the delegates were ethnic Chinese, they were Jamaican nationals. China embassy said, it's out of their hands. Now this should all be understood within the context of Jamaican history and what was going down in that country during the 1960s. There was a lot of economic hardship being felt by many. And I don't want anyone to believe these anti-Chinese riots were all that was happening in Jamaica. 1960s, one thing was pretty certain. The Chinese had managed to build a near monopoly in many sectors of the retail trade. 90% of the dry goods stores operated throughout the country were owned by ethnic Chinese. 95% of the supermarkets, too. Bedding parlors where... Drop Pan, Pika Pao, and other games of chance were played, all owned by Chinese. The laundries, too. Thanks to many of the policies of the Michael Manley government in the 1970s, what began to happen was that a lot of Chinese started to pack up and get out. After the 1965 riots, already there were plenty of Chinese quitting Jamaica for greener pastures to the north, in and around Miami, in New York, and in Toronto. Beginning in the 1980s and into the 1990s, Chinese people were still coming to Jamaica. Chinese they may have been, but they weren't exactly the same as the ones who had been coming since 1854. This group, for lack of a better name, were called the New Chinese, as opposed to the Old Chinese, who were primarily Hakka-speaking or traced their ancestry to southernmost Guangdong province. Well, we know what happens most of the time when people emigrate to other countries, my family no exception. First generation makes all the biggest sacrifices and tries to keep the old traditions alive and are able to browbeat the second generation into sticking with the traditions. But third and fourth generations, the passion for the old ways from the old country fades and the first thing that usually goes is the language and less and less people in Jamaica were able to speak Hakka, as their primary language of communication became English and Jamaican Patois. Chinatown, too, the old community that grew up along Berry Street, downtown Kingston, that also faded into Jamaica's past cultural history. But some things like Gasan during the Qingming holiday, sweeping the graves of one's ancestors, is still going strong, and the Benevolent Association ran a Miss Chinese Jamaica pageant till 1962. There was a magazine there that ran from the 1940s till the 70s called The Pagoda that offered up some news and lifestyle features in the Chinese Jamaican community. But these post-1980s arrivals, they were mostly from Taiwan and Hong Kong. And they weren't there to cut sugar cane or open up a grocery store out in the nooks and crannies of the Jamaican countryside. They were there to open up textile and garment factories. And migrant Chinese factory workers came too. These people were Mandarin and Cantonese speakers. The Taiwanese factory bosses also spoke Fujian dialects. Old Chinese and New Chinese. They didn't mix as much as you'd think they would. In 1988, the Chinese Cultural Association was established that reached out to these New Chinese the Chinese Benevolent Association opened up in a new location at 176 Old Hope Road in Kingston. They're still around today, and like their fellow ethnic Chinese around the world who belong to all the many Zhongguo Huiguan, or Chinese Benevolent Associations, they keep the flame of Chinese culture burning from generation to generation, including the teaching of the languages of their ancestors, wherever their home was in China. Now, before we close things out, I wanted to just mention one more thing about a few notable Chinese Jamaicans. 
Their names were Vincent Randy Chin, his wife Patricia Chin, Byron Lee, Justin Yap, Leslie Kong, Bunny Stryker Lee, Mikey Mao Chung, Ernest Hu Kim, well, and others too. Unless you have the reggae and Caribbean music-loving gene, maybe you never heard of them. These Chinese Jamaicans all played oversized roles in popularizing Jamaican music and helping to shape the sound of reggae as recording engineers, as a music label, as distributors of this music to the world, and also as musicians. Randy Chin's father came to Jamaica in the 1920s after a short stint in Cuba. And Randy got into the record business by chance and... During the late 1950s and early 60s, he began recording all the island's most promising musicians who were digging the trenches and pouring the foundation of that fantastic Jamaican sound. Randy and Patricia Chin later set up Studio 17, which became one of the major recording studios in Kingston. They moved the operation to New York in 1979, and their label, VP Records, later became the largest independent recording label and distributor of Caribbean music in the world. Leslie Kong's family had an ice cream shop in Kingston with a record store on the second floor, and it was called Beverly's. Leslie was the first one to record then 14-year-old Jimmy Cliff, and when Jimmy became big, he brought other musicians to Leslie Kong's Beverly label, including a young welder with big dreams in 1962 named Bob Marley, looking to cut his first record. Leslie Kong went on to become the biggest record producer in Jamaica, but his life was cut tragically short in 1971, dying of a heart attack at the age of only 37. Some of you may know of Byron Lee and the Dragonairs. Byron Lee, yeah, he was another Hakka Chinese Jamaican, born in the parish of Manchester in the Jamaican countryside. He was a superstar singing in all the big five genres of ska, rocksteady, reggae, calypso, and soca. Besides what he achieved as a performer and recording artist, Byron Lee's other claim to fame is appearing in the first James Bond picture, Dr. No. That is, the first Bond film featuring Sean Connery. Dr. No was set in Kingston, and Byron Lee and the Dragonairs are in a scene at a bar performing Jump Up. Mikey, Mao Chung... Hailed from the same town as Jimmy Cliff, but he grew up in Kingston. He recently passed away in December 2021. Mikey Chung was a multi-instrumentalist, music arranger, and producer who worked with many of the international names we all know and love. Scratch Perry, Sly and Robbie, Black Uhuru, and Peter Tosh, to name a few. So these Chinese Jamaicans, they had a heavy hand in spreading this sound that People the world over, me included, fell in love with. And this music became a convenient gateway for learning about many of the other great things about Jamaica. Today, there's Tessan Chin, a talented recording artist whose father is Jamaican Chinese. She won season five of The Voice. Her sister Tammy is also a singer, songwriter, and dancer. So... I have to admit, most all of this was new to me, and I didn't know about the legacy of these Chinese Jamaicans who had such a profound impact on the production and propagation around the world of reggae and the whole Jamaican and Caribbean sound. So let's just wind things down here. Many thanks to my brother Russell in the Sunshine State. He's from Trinidad and not Jamaica, but he gave me a few good tips, especially about the reggae part. I wanted to present this topic as another in a long line of episodes that look not so much at the history of China, but of the Chinese people who left the homeland and created new lives overseas for themselves and their descendants. And these Chinese immigrants became part of another history. In this case, the history of Jamaica, a country that anyone living there could tell you is a place that stays true to its motto, out of many one people. Besides the Chinese, there were many others who emigrated to Jamaica and had similar stories to tell all over the greater Antilles from western Cuba to eastern Puerto Rico. You'll find the descendants of all these people who left China in times of great hardship and settled there. 
Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba were the three biggest destinations for Chinese in the Caribbean. Jamaica's population today is about 2.8, 2.9 million. Okay, this is a this is a big history, and it takes more than 40 minutes to tell, but any journey begins with a single step, and it was my hope to provide that basic introduction. This Jamaican Chinese history may not be as consequential as overseas Chinese histories go, you know, compared to elsewhere, but it's still a history worth telling, and in the years to come, if I'm granted some degree of longevity, I'll keep coming back to this reservoir of Great stories and history. For a bit of nice Jamaican history, if you want to start somewhere, there's always the legendary Royfield Brown's How Jamaica Conquered the World podcast. Over two dozen episodes available of some nice Jamaican history. The link is at the show notes, of course. My highest recommendations. Royfield Brown, How Jamaica Conquered the World. I'd like to thank you all for listening. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California. Do consider coming back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.